OK, so what I'd like to do is just give you a, a quick tour of the product and dive into some of the pages that Sanjit briefly showed and some of them that he mentioned. And of course, keep it interactive. So uh, just like you did with Sanjit, please go ahead and ask questions, and we'll answer them on the fly. If you want to dive into a particular uh, part, then we can do that as well. And just try to make it interactive and fun. And let's give it a whirl. So I'm going to log into the dashboard here. And what I'm going to do is going to go to Meraki Corp. And this is the main landing page that an administrator will arrive at when managing a network like Meraki's Wireless. And this is the one here in San Francisco. So of course, we see a Google map here with the location. We can switch that to satellite view and zoom in a little bit. And that's the building that we're in right now. You can see it's between uh, 18th and 19th streets. And the green icons indicate which APs are currently active. The green color indicates that they are online. The number indicates how many clients have recently connected to each AP. So what we can do here is actually just hover over any of them and see, of course, we've named them according to their approximate location, some fourth floor, some third floor APs, and so on. So why don't we go ahead and click into one of the ones over here, fourth floor screening room. That's actually the AP that many of you are probably connected to. <laughs> no, don't not touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if you're doing any type of monitoring, any type of troubleshooting, this is a great way to dive into a particular AP and get some st statistics about that. Check the health. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we can see how much traffic you're using. I take advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so wireless guru, who are you? <laughs> Guilty as charged, right? So 500, yeah, what is he doing? 500, 581 <laughs> megabytes. I said, I said, you just hit download. Can I stay connected? And you are connected. Uh, your signal strength right now is 31 dB. If you put it under the table, it might drop a little bit. I'm trying to figure out use 32 megs. I'm streaming, that's why I got up there. I'm going to use Shut up. And you can see many of you are actually on channel 36. Somebody's camped out on channel 6. Actually, that's me with my iPhone. It's in my pocket right now. You can see the signal strength is fluctuating. That's in real time. It's uh, just reporting. So you can use that for connectivity and troubleshooting of a particular client. If I wanted to, I can just go ahead and ping right here. And this is actually going to send two streams of ping packets, one to the AP itself, because we want to check the health of that AP, and the next right to the client that I clicked on. In this case, wireless guru, no loss, latency is pretty low. Same with the AP, right? And that's just going to keep going until I stop it. I'll stop it here, go back to the current clients. Now, a few other tools are available there. If you want to run trace route, if you want to run throughput testing, if you need to blink the LEDs, actually, that's a pretty useful function. If you have a lot of APs and you're trying to figure out which one exactly you're configuring, just hit that button and they start flashing. Pretty nice. And this here shows the current Ethernet traffic that's flowing out of this device. It is a gateway, so it is connected through Ethernet. And you can see that up and down traffic we're looking at a little bit under 300 kilobits per second right now. OK? So from here, of course, we could go to any other AP, troubleshoot that AP. But what I'd like to do is actually go into the clients page and show you a little bit more of what Sanjit introduced in his presentation. Now, by clicking on the clients page, I can see an overview of what's been happening, let's say, over the past two hours, over the past week. Let's go ahead and click on the past month. And we'll see how many clients connected to this, S, to this network, how much traffic they pushed across. You can see the usage pattern across those days. And in this case, we transferred over 740 gigabyte, gigabytes of data. And just like Sandit showed, you can use this to search anyone. right? So I can search for myself, Pablo. I have a MacBook Pro. I have an iPhone. Search for Richard. He's got a MacBook Pro. I can also search for user Richard and actually see which other devices he might have. Uh, it turns out he has an Android also. That's in his pocket right now, probably. And just like I can search for users, I can search for things like iPads, XP devices, Android, and so on. All right. Is that search yep. only based off of um, the description, or are you also looking at like an OUI mapping? 
yourself? So great, great question. The, the question is, is that search just based on description, or is, are there other parameters? And so we do take uh, into account a number of parameters, like DHCP, host names, right? search for the username, if, as I just showed you with Richard's username. So there are a number of parameters that go into identifying that. And we'll see a little bit later how that actually ties into doing things like applying policies by device type. Yeah, great question. OK, so now what I can actually do is I can actually pick any of these. I can, let's say, search for an iPad and go into this one. This is an iPad that we have in the marketing department. And in this case, we can see more details about a particular client. So it's a similar view to what we see about the AP, but now we're going to go dive into a client instead of the infrastructure. And we can see some automatically detected and reported parameters. For example, this is an iPad with 2.4 and 5 gigahertz 11N capability. Uh, it's been automatically classified as an iP Apple iPad. And we can see the signal strength there. That's in real time. It's pretty strong, so it must be fairly close to an AP. And that AP is this third floor support one. So if we wanted to kind of trace backwards from a particular client, maybe who's having a connectivity issue or a performance issue, we could search for the client, see which AP it's connected to, and then go back to the AP and run some of those tests that I just showed you. Okay. Are you doing any basic RTLS or, or device tracking with threat operation? Yeah, so the, the question is, are we doing any basic RTLS or device tracking? Uh, yes, we are. And I can zoom in here and see the approximate location of that device. But is that based on three APs or one AP? Yeah, it's, in this case, it's based on five APs. You can see up here. Oh, okay. So it's using triangulation data from, <laughs> from five APs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm looking at my dashboard, and I didn't see it either. If you could read, he would have. <laughs> 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 so why would you be pretty? One of, the, one of the questions on Twitter mentioned uh, can you use these to look at uh, air quality and the response was, yes, we have internet. Can you use these to plot sources of interference on the map as mm -hmm. well, identifying this plot those sources of interference? Yeah, so there, there's a few ways that we can do that. And uh, kind of the, a very common example of that would be through rogue SSID or rogue AP detection. And we do that through our WIPs page, which I'll just show you very quickly here. And that's going to summarize information coming from uh, all of the APs that are on the network. And that includes uh, all of these that you see here. And it's going to report the known SSIDs or unknown SSIDs that it sees, including, for example, here we see, oops, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, for example, this one classified as a rogue, and you can see the approximate location of that rogue SSID. You can see which APs have seen it and get a read on the signal strength of that seen rogue SSIP, SSID from those APs. And then if you want to do further, take further action, then you can, from here, actually go ahead and contain that rogue SSID. So can you we'll do this with non-Wi-Fi, layer one stuff? OK, not, so non-Wi-Fi. Yeah, sorry, this is the particular the Wi-Fi page. So actually, I'm going to go back to the, the AP page and show you here. Let's click on. <coughs> and we were looking at fourth floor screening room. And so here we have some channel utilization. And that channel utilization will load a graph of statistics pertaining to both channels. It's a dual band AP, so 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And you'll see this is updating in real time to show all of the 802.11 traffic. So it's using CSMA, carrier sense multiple access detection, and actually looking at the headers of those 802.11, in the case when they are, uh, packets to see which ones are or aren't 802.11 interferers, right? So it's looking at that to look at the utilization and interference uh, on each of those channels. So if we fired a bunch of RF jammers in the room, you would need to be able to plot those on a map? You mean the location of those? Yeah. Right. Uh, if they're non-802.11. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Want to test that? Yeah. Can I suppose no. they can <laughs> <laughs> test it? Yeah. 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 We've got the jammers. Uh, yeah. How many antennas do you have? <laughs> um, so going back a little bit to the client's page, so looking at the marketing iPad that we have here, search for it, click on it. Now, a few things we can do here. We can, of course, ping the client as we did before. We can see the traffic that this client has used. In this case, uh, it looks like a lot of YouTube, 
It's like 650 megabytes of YouTube, and some Pandora has been flowing on this one. So it looks like kind of a recreational iPad. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> can you tell me what I'm pulling? Uh, we can look at you. He wants to know why his Mac is doing this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you shooting what everybody else is <laughs> So you, you, you open the floodgates now, so there's no going back, right? So, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, who's Tom? That's not me. <laughs> so HAL 9000 just popped up with a ton of traffic. <laughs> but, you know, we pointed, at, the finger was pointed at Wireless Guru, right? So why not? All right, George. What are you doing? So it looks like. Email. Oh. 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 <laughs> Big attachments. Big attachments, exactly. <laughs> and Gmail. It's uploaded. Yeah, what do people send you? Oh, that's, that's down there. That's, that's down. down. That's being pulled into. Oh, yeah. Yep. 450 megabytes of down. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's great, though. That's okay. a great interface. I mean, you, 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 you get torn over port 25. <laughs> 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 you tell them, very productive today. Very productive, exactly. It's all email. No Twitter, right? So I'm going to go back here. So now I, I did want to point out the, the uh, details about the iPad, but I wanted to actually go further. Now with clients, we can, of course, see their connectivity, see which applications uh, they're running, like we just did, how much traffic they're sending. You can see, for example, what channel this particular iPad is using. But for individual devices, we can actually go a, le a level deeper and dig into actually what's happening on this particular device. And this is a look into our systems manager page. And here we can actually peel back the layers of the client's onion and see this is a 16 gigabyte app, uh, Apple iPad. It's running iOS 5.0.1. Uh, you can see it's got 9 gig gigabytes of data free. Uh, you can see some information like the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth Mac and so on. How do you know how to do this? Right now. Is there a client on the on the device that reports this? There, yes, there, there's a client. There's a client that's been installed <laughs> okay. on this device. Exactly. So that whole privacy talk just got thrown right out the right. window. So this is a Meraki-owned iPad, and we use it for events and demos and things like that, as well as just general productivity. And we installed our systems manager agent on that to have a company-owned and company-managed device. So uh, you can see here it's, it's uh, online right now. Looks like there was a blip of uh, inactivity right here. See more restrictions, what kind of profiles it has installed, what are the installed apps. We'll look at, the, uh, look at a few more apps. Activities, right? Activity of installing apps, refreshing device information, et cetera. So I'll go back up here for a second and so actually. <laughs> Do we find a lot of people not working? Yeah. This is work. <laughs> Angry birds? Angry birds. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Actually, why don't, why don't we go ahead and dive into that? So. Can we get their scores? <laughs> and then you want to delete the score? Oh, uh, a Meraki leaderboard? A Meraki leaderboard. That's a good idea. So if you want to add a new iOS app and deploy it to a number of iOS devices, just do that here. So uh, anyone want to pick, up, uh, pick out a favorite app? Not Angry Birds, because we already installed it on this one. What's that the $10,000 app from the University of California Law School? <laughs> Stupid Zombies. Stupid Zombies? <laughs> so you're killing MDM and MAM right here. Right? You're deploying apps to your devices right through your infrastructure, right? Or it's versus You're killing with Mobile Iron and a lot of AirWatch's products do. Right here. You're killing it. Right, right. I mean, farts versus zombies. Yeah. So maybe not stupid zombies. You can. Separate package. Salesforce. Salesforce.com, right? There we go. Then if you want to install the Salesforce mobile app onto all of the iOS devices, just add it here. Yeah, Wi Fi Perf. And then we can choose to install it on all the devices that are part of this managed network, or we can install it only on developers sales iPads, any type of group that we've defined. Of course, we don't necessarily want Salesforce on a developer's iPad. We probably want it on a salesperson's iPad, right? Now, we can see here which ones are managed, which ones are installed, push those out. I'd like to show you then a little bit more of those iOS-specific settings. Okay. 
Now, here's where we actually configure some iOS specific settings parameters that apply to, of course, things like iPad. And kind of top of mind in those cases are often things like restrictions, right? Yes, Jennifer. Is it just iOS right now? Or do you have Android in the works and on down the line? So we have iOS right now as well as PCs and Macs. Court. <laughs> do we have a request for WebOS? He hasn't raised his hand yet. I do like WebOS. <laughs> <laughs> no need to integrate support. They don't even have Angry Birds. So, for example, if you want to enable restrictions on uh, an iOS device, right? There are a lot of restrictions that you could actually configure here. So, clicking on Enforce Restrictions allows you as a network administrator, as a device administrator, to allow or deny many different services. Right? So for example, you can disallow installing of apps, uh, disallow screen capture, Siri for example, no in-app purchases. Certain applications come installed by default, but you can, for example, not allow YouTube, uh, if you so choose, not allow Safari and so forth. And then I. You guys must have a real bad day. Can you really make that iPad really a lot of fun? Yes. <laughs> How about in education with like parental restrictions, right? You want them to use it, but just for the appropriate content. Any, any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think for uh, content ratings, so we have some content ratings for installing apps there. Uh, for accessing particular websites, I guess you're, you're thinking about? Um, I'm more concerned probably with in-app content because websites, you, know, you, you can do proxies all day long. That's an easy technology. Yeah. In-app stuff is the harder one right now because I mean, they load up an app, and the content that's coming through the app, you have, I mean, proxy has no yeah, insight. You're coming to grab it, so you, your kids could rack up $5,000 worth of Smurfs charges when you never have. It'll happen one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 here's a good example. You load up the Netflix app, and you want your students to use it to pull down specific content, but not the, you know. Prison break episode. Only, yeah. you know, G-rated content, not PG-13 or anything like that, right? I mean, just as an example, right? I don't know. Yeah, that's certainly something that's, that's uh, worthwhile to look into. Um, probably also depends on what type of functionality Apple allows into this. Yeah, um, and that's what I was about to ask is, is this something that you guys develop on your own, or is this something that you're pulling from an API through Apple? So this is something that we develop, but it's enabled by those hooks that Apple provides. Okay. And oftentimes, we'll get the question, well, oh, can't, can I do this with uh, Android devices, right? So the hooks in Android aren't the same. They don't map one to one as they do uh, to, to the iOS hooks, right? So Apple's actually done a pretty good job of building that functionality in there to, of course, what, what they're looking to do is gain footholds in the enterprise, right? And what people are concerned about is how do I have control over my corporate-owned device? How do I make sure my employees are doing what I want them to do and not what I don't want them to do? And Apple's just making, making it easy for that adoption to increase further and further. Okay. Then one more thing I wanted to show you is just point up here that this is for a particular profile. And with different profiles, we can have different configurations for different groups or categories of devices. right? So we can look at the marketing settings. I'm not going to save any change here. Configure the marketing iPads or iOS devices. And define different restrictions and different levels of security for each of those groups of devices. Now, that's, this actually plays into mobile device management and actually accessing the network. Because we can use these to define and apply a policy that's applied to uh, a device that's connecting to the network that, it, that shows up. Yes? So are you doing any sort of uh, automated posturing of that machine when you first bring it online? Um, you know, what's your, what's kind of your mantra regarding bringing your own device and managing it? Yeah, so, so great question. Is, uh, you know, what's our, our stance on bring your own device and how does that work? How does it happen? Um, yeah, so why don't I go ahead and, and show you how that's done, actually. Let me, let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to back out of here and back into the dashboard of the wireless network that we were looking at and go into configure access control. And what we'll do here is we'll actually use this function to assign group policies by device type. And right now it's disabled, but I can simply enable it. And now what I can do is define categories or define group types and make sure that a certain policy that I want is applied to every type, of, every member of that device type. So clicking on Add Group Policy, I can say for every iPad, 
I can assign the group policy called, let's say, iPad. Right? For any other device, Mac OS X that I've assigned to contractors, for example, I can do that. Now, it, you're, all, you're probably wondering also, well, OK, that's for all iPads, right? So what else can I do? Well, we can actually create a, a group policy. And I'll show you how to do that by going into here, group policies. And you see here, there's one called iPad that we've set up. Uh, there's no bandwidth limit. Uh, the client is not tagged with a particular VLAN tag. It's using the default splash page that is configured on that uh, network. You can also choose to bypass it. And then there's particular fire firewall rules that we can apply to all of those devices that have this group policy applied. Now, if we wanted to, we can go down here and add a group. <coughs> and let's say app iPad employees. And say we want to actually allow people to bring in their own iPad. We want to set the bandwidth limit to 500 kilobits per second. Uh, we don't need to v do VLAN tagging. We don't need to worry about the splash page. If we wanted to add custom firewall rules, we could do that. And then I save the changes. And I can now go back. And if any client shows up on the network, I can actually choose to apply this particular policy. So for example, go to, poli go to a client. Again, search for iPad. Going back to this marketing iPad that we have, click on Edit Details. And I can do a number of things here. I can have it whitelisted. I can have it blocked. If it's blocked, say no iPads on the network. <laughs> right? And then the next time the user tries to access the network, this splash page will appear informing the user. You know, Normally, you don't want this kind of message. right? You'll say, please see the IT department or something. <laughs> that's kind of the, that's a scare them, right? Don't talk to the IT department. <laughs> don't come. You're not allowed, and don't come to us. <laughs> we know your name. We will be contacting you. <laughs> yeah. We're contacting you right now. How um, are you doing that? And then we can apply the. I'm sorry. How are, you, how are you displaying that message? Is that they have to open up a web browser and they get redirected to your captive portal, which then says it. So if they launch Outlook, they're just going to be why the heck is my machine network? All it, it's going to show. It's going to pop up a splash page. Yeah. Like a dialog box or yeah, like a dialog box, yeah. So if you if you put it on to okay, well, let's say you put it onto my laptop here right. that you don't have an agent installed on or anything and you and you block it, will I just not see that? Uh, I'll just be I'll just can't pass traffic and I'm like, why am I not getting No no you'll get a splash pop up, even if it doesn't have a client uh, an agent installed. What if you don't uh, launch your browser though? Yes, yeah. If you don't launch your browser launch the browser, you're never gonna see that message, correct? Yes, yes. So you have to, I guess, at some point, launch the browser. OK, and then applying these group policies, I, we just defined this one, iPad employees. And so by clicking that, save, and then now this iPad has this group policy that we just defined applied. So Sam, does that give you a, a better idea of, of how we handle incoming devices? And really, the, the great thing about that is that you can set those device policies to automatically apply, let's say, for Apple iPad, you don't have to worry about MAC addresses. You don't have to worry about OUIs or anything like that. That's just going to be automatically applied by the network. And for those that you want to handle a little bit differently, then you can just go in and edit their details. Yes? For the other page where you were activating and apply different policies based on device type, or yep. some, can I define my own device types, or do I have to use just the device types that you So I'll say, for example, I've got like e-readers that it's using Android, but I want to do something just specifically with this type of e-reader because it needs capture portal. Yeah, so great question. So um, the question is, to repeat those uh, watching online, uh, is can I define my own device types so that I can then create a device type policy and apply it? For example, e-readers. And that's a great example, actually, because uh, last year we saw a pretty significant uptick in uh, Kindles and Kindle Fires, Kindle Fires especially. And that's really, I think, where uh, some of the, the power and the benefit of our architecture comes in and really delivers for customers. Because we see these devices showing up, and then we can quickly identify them through our client fingerprinting, and then add them to a list of known, uh, known devices, device types. Right? So to answer your question directly, you can't uh, edit in here the particular device type list and add your own. But uh, 
customers work with us, and for example, with Kindle Fire, we added that pretty quickly. I think someone's familiar with this, which is specifically for anything that's where they came from. But that, that happens quite a bit with features like this. Yeah, so uh, to repeat John's comment, that actually, that particular case came from the Make-A-Wish. Somebody typed something like this, right? And uh, then that's how we implemented it. So keep asking for WebOS. It can happen. <laughs> <laughs> keep asking for WebOS. <laughs> Great. Any, any other questions about uh, bring your own device or mobile device management, that kind of thing? Yes, Andrew. So you did um, policy based on device type. Can you do policy based on user role and device type? So <laughs> do we want to allow some iPads? that are corporate issued in a certain department, but other iPads we don't want to allow? Yeah, like so, so you can integrate with, this is typically going to be done with something like 802.1x and Radius, yes. right? So you can uh, definitely set up Radius in your back end for authentication. That's what we <laughs> have here. Uh, and when we log on, for example, with my iPhone or, or my laptop, I'm using my 802.1x credentials. And then you can layer these on top of that. Cool. Yep. OK, uh, another thing I'd like to just uh, touch on is we went over the applications that are, that are running. And so we looked at a few of the uh, clients here that were actually transferring a lot of data. And then I just want to show you that graph that Sanjit mentioned uh, that we built here, the pie chart, and have a look at what those applications are. And when I expand this pie chart, I can actually see that list of applications. By default, it's showing me the top 20. I can expand those to show all of them. And you'll see uh, kind of the, the activity that's been going on in this network over the past month. So big, big use of Dropbox. You can see I, I can hover over it there, and I can see on the graph above which part of the traffic is actually Dropbox. It's uh, about 28% of the traffic, so 200, almost 250 gigabytes of data, right? A few other uh, backup services that are, that are in use, but not nearly as much as Dropbox in particular. We're also using file sharing, so no surprise, we have a file sharing server, right? And that's pretty popular. And then email. Uh, we use Gmail here at Meraki. It's a great, great service. And Gmail is right up there with 4% uh, of the traffic. Email as a, as a total or as a group is actually 7.3% of the traffic. So you can really actually get a lot of detail as to what kind of traffic is flowing on your network. For example, here in the Dropbox, right? Maybe people are using Dropbox for fair for sharing files internally within a team. Maybe they're actually backing up their entire computer to Dropbox. Maybe it's worthwhile to look into, well, what is our backup strategy for people's computers, right? They need to protect their data. We need to have data recovery. What's going on? It looks like people want to share or backup files because they're using Dropbox a lot. Right. And then we can see other types of traffic. Uh, YouTube is no slouch here, of course. We see 42 gigabytes of traffic. And anyone want to dive into a particular app and kind of Peel back the layers on, on an app? Yeah. iTunes. iTunes. OK, great. Just pick a safe one. Pick a safe one. <laughs> I think I'll pick a Mega Video doesn't have that much traffic. It's only a, a couple hundred megs. Yeah, we have uh, Torrent uh, classified here. And I don't know how much BitTorrent we actually have on this network. Uh, here we go, encrypted bit, uh, encrypted peer to peer, which is actually uh, 3.6 gigabytes of traffic. It's not a terrible amount. Why not click into here? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, all one person. 99.7%, right? Now, this is the appropriate time to go in here and edit details and say no more. I can do wireless gurus. It's only 32K. Four. It can't be anything that great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of traffic you want to actually uh, really be aware of. Of course, for some uh, organizations, this is a liability concern, right, for uh, copyright infringement and things like that. Uh, in general, it's just going to eat, eat up a lot of traffic on the network, right? And if you don't want your users to do this, then you might just want to okay, mail it so you do you have encrypted peer-to-peer -peer traffic, and you drill into that. How deep into it can you get? Uh, so r we can't actually read the user data of that right. encrypted uh, stream. Okay. Right. It's kind of yeah. like even recognizing that traffic is actually like the uh, one, one of the guys downstairs with a PhD in you know, network for a very long time trying to figure out how to recognize your traffic because it's very tricky. Oh, 
like, yeah. Looks like right. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy to identify. But I was wondering, especially from the encrypted perspective, because firewall vendors are starting to do some really scary stuff with encrypted traffic, and I will do that. Have you guys stacked up against them? Yeah. And, and Sam, I'll go to your question. I'll just repeat John's comment so that the audience online can hear it. And John said that uh, actually one of the uh, Engineers downstairs has a PhD in networking and actually spent a lot of time to figure out how to identify and classify encrypted peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Yes, Sam. So you've, uh, you've clearly spent a lot of time on the, on the UI uh, for this particular interface. Can you talk about any um, restrictions from a browser compatibility issue or Flash versus HTML5 or you know, some of those other um, NMS platform discussions that have come up throughout the past couple of years? Yeah, Sam's question is, can I, uh, I've been showing off the UI quite a bit. Can I talk about what's Flash, what's HTML5, what kind of browser compatibilities uh, do, do we have? And it's, uh, the dashboard is accessible by any uh, standards-based browser, like Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox. There are no Flash components, so you don't have to worry about Flash, which means that you can use this uh, on an iPad. Right? You can use it on your phone, too. I've done that, actually. Um, on the iPad, the actual, you know, the size of the iPad is just great. And you can just click around, do some searches. It really lends itself to be able to uh, just kind of see the whole network and monitor and manage that network in your hands. It's pretty, pretty swift. So I'm not going to block this, this person. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll let our IT person know, you know, that maybe you want to look in, into this. But it, instead, you know, blocking, blocking an individual user, that'll take, uh, kind of drastic action on this user. But I'd like to instead go to uh, <laughs> go to the traffic checker. Events and, and alerts based on specific traffic? For example, if you suspect that someone's using it in obfuscated port to sneak data out the back door, can you, can you start an alert on it? So can you, uh, what kind can of data you, did you say? Just an alert. So if someone's trying to take data out the back door, yeah. like, like if you see a giant a Dropbox train for happening at three in the morning. Yeah. Can, can you have alerts based on that, or yeah. would it just show up in the reporting? Yeah. Uh, not right now. We do have a monthly automated summary that goes out to the network administrator. That's, that's definitely a great point, though, that we could uh, look into is how to add like if there's any particular spike of X Y Z type right. of traffic. Like yeah. Real time alerting. Yeah. 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 And we we have a lot of built-in real time alerting for letting you know if an AP is offline, yeah. if you know if something happened in terms of the infrastructure. And th that's a great suggestion. Yes, thank you. Do you have uh, escalations built in those alerts? In other words, if, yeah. if Bag of Donuts engineer doesn't respond, you know, in an hour, <laughs> the, you know, and is it Donuts engineer? <laughs> yeah, so we, we actually have a model of uh, network administrators and organizational administrators. And that's really designed for uh, organizations that have more than one network and probably have a, a small team of IT, let's say, to manage the network. And what you can do is, let's say, if you're in charge for all the networks, you can say, I have visibility and control into every site, every network. And, but people on my team, they have access each to one of those individually and not to each others. Right? You can do that. You can also have uh, read-only access if you want to have people only be able to monitor the network and not be able to change or control anything. But can you, can you bubble up? You know, if there's no response, it then moves up to the next. Yeah, level. you can, you can, you can have. Uh, I guess there's no uh, kind of timeout uh, of, let's say, if, if there was no response, there's no timeout of a particular alert. So you can choose to alert the organizational admin or or not alert them. Yeah. Um, you can also, if you integrate, uh, you have an SNMP based system. You can integrate that with our, our dashboard. So if you got all those policies yeah. set up, just back in the market. Thanks, Karen. I'll, I'll just repeat Karen's uh, comment for, for the audience. Uh, if you are running some type of SNMP-based monitoring system, then you can integrate those hooks that we have in Dashboard to uh, alert in that type of, type of way. Uh, next question you may have already covered, but when you're looking at the actual um, Google map or you know, the overlay, can you shift into multi-floor view? In other words, can you bring up a specific floor? Yeah, let, let me go ahead and show you that, actually. Yeah. And w what we can do is we can, if you're looking for a particular client or an AP, then we can go here and let's say fourth floor uh, screening room is the room we're in right now. And in this case, it's on the floor floor. So we have a floor plan that we've uploaded. Uh, and we are over here. It's the south side of the building. 
this is the AP that we're looking at. You can see the coffee counters over here just outside. And uh, there was a foosball table at one point here. It's no longer here, unfortunately. It's down on the second floor. But you can use this to see where your APs are located. It's a very useful tool to actually be able to walk around, see where they're located, measure you know, links between the APs. See down here, this AP is meshed strongly with a neighboring AP. It's called fourth floor near fax stairs. Uh, it's about 19 meters away. Link quality is pretty good. And it's linked through channel, uh, channel 36. And then if I wanted to look at all of the APs, you can just go back here to monitor overview. Go to the fourth floor. So these are all the APs on the fourth floor. You can see, again, the icon indicating how many clients have connected recently. And we have the third floor. You can zoom into the third floor. Here you go. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer's question is, do, do we do any type of client uh, tracking or, uh, or location tracking? Um, we do triangulation based on the APs that I showed you a little bit earlier, when we had that, the five APs reporting the location of a particular device. And then we'll integrate with a solution like Ekahau to provide real-time location. No, for that, for that, you'd want to integrate something like, like Ekahau or, or a dedicated RTLS solution. And this is designed to give you a, an idea of location of particular devices. Many of our customers uh, that have, um, let's say, medical carts or manufacturing devices, they definitely do that to place a, a tag on the device and track their, their location down to a, to a very uh, specific level. Any, any other questions about the floor plans? OK, then uh, we were kind of, uh, we were talking about the YouTube traffic and, uh, sorry, not the YouTube, the peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Yes, Sam. I actually have a question about the floor plans. Um, do you do any sort of approximated RF coverage, heat bloom, visibility? Uh, you know, a lot of customers like bloom is pretty much. Yeah, so uh, we don't have that in integrated into the dashboard. We do have a few planning tools that will allow you to uh, use your, your computer to actually walk around and map that and see what that looks like. But it's not, it's not in this view here. Yep. But those are free tools. Yeah, those are free tools, yep. So what do we want to do about the peer-to-peer -peer traffic, right? We can actually create a rule for this network and say peer-to-peer. -peer, and we can choose a limit if we want to rate limit that. We want to knock it down to 266 kilobits per second, for example. We could do that and slow it down. That way, people aren't thinking, oh, I'm just going to go to the office, and I'm going to download all my DVDs and all my music, right? Because the internet connection is really fast. So no, nope, it's not going to happen if we do that. <laughs> some people smiling and looking at each other. No, nobody does that. Um, of course, for some people, especially with peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, they want to block it entirely, not just rate limit it. So we can add a layer 7 firewall rule. And this is built into the access point, and will actually block any one of these same categories that you see here. And of course, we're not going to want to block something like email or VoIP, but something like peer-to-peer -peer is really a great candidate for a Layer 7 firewall rule. And that includes apps like BitTorrent, Kazaa, Nutella, uh, encrypted peer-to-peer -peer traffic like we saw, you know, any of your favorite type of uh, egregious applications, let's say. Nobody knows what these are, right? Nobody's ever heard of these names. <laughs> and you know, that way, for the network administrator, the network administrator doesn't have to worry about keeping up to, keeping up to date with a particular, uh, let's say, a new peer-to-peer -peer app that just showed up uh, on the college campus or something like that, that all of a sudden became really popular with the students. This is built into the dashboard. And as an administrator, you don't have to worry about, oh, well, how am I going to block Kazaa versus Nutella, or what if, what if it's encrypted? So it's the same thing for actually doing the, the reverse and making sure that critical applications are prioritized, like Skype and email and VoIP. Instead of doing this to rate limit, I can switch this to VoIP and video conferencing. And instead of moving the slider around, I'll 
choose ignore SSID limit. And in that case, all of those applications aren't going to be throttled by the wireless. And that includes things like SIP-based voice systems and Skype, which, as Sanjit mentioned, can be pretty hard to track because it's got a range of ports. Sometimes it's port 80, sometimes it's peer-to-peer, -peer and so on. And that way, a network administrator doesn't have to actually deal with host names and ports and actually can just deal with it on an application level. And if you do want to go to host names and ports, you can do that also. If you want to do a remote IP range, enter that there. Remote IP range and port range, enter that as well. So you can do that if you want to actually target individual ones that you already know. But really, the value is actually being able to select a category and then throttle can that you or block that. Can you only choose by port, or can you not choose by port range? Uh, let's go back here. Here. You'd have to enter a range of IP and then a particular port and for that range. a specific port. So like, for instance, I couldn't set it up to block uh, RTP video, because that could be 32,000 ports. Uh, yes, correct. Okay. Hmm. Not something you normally have to do. Yep. Yep. Any, any questions about this? The traffic shaping? Uh, identifying applications, the layer 7 firewall, that kind of thing. OK, a few more things I, I'd like to touch on uh, pretty quickly. One of them is actually going to be here in access control. Oops. And um, we briefly talked about NAC. Um, Tangent mentioned it at the beginning. And NAC is one of those things that actually we found is very useful for our customers, especially when they're managing branches that maybe they don't have the resources or capacity to deploy NAC at each of those locations, right? And so what we've done with NAC is actually we're able to configure it and apply it through the dashboard. And actually, that's applied at the AP level. So a client is joining the network, is first checked to see if there is antivirus software installed and running. And then if not, the client is led to a quarantined area where they can download, let's say, an allowed type of software package. So let's say Microsoft Security Essentials or something like that. And then after that installation is successful, then they're allowed to join the network. Yes? So from a licensing and costing standpoint, is this all out of the box, or are these modules that the customers are using? Yeah, so the question, the question is, uh, from a licensing and cost perspective, is this all out of the box? Everything I've shown you today is built into all of our 802.11 NAPs. And so what you see here is the NAC. And how do, you, how do you enable it or disable it? You simply go here to click, click to disable, click to enable. You can send users to a standard remediation site, or you can send them to a custom URL, and then enter your remediation URL. And that's where they will download or install anything that you might provide on your own. Okay. So this is a great thing to do, especially when you're allowing unmanaged devices. People have laptops, they're coming in. You don't know what kind of device they might have. They're connecting to their guest network. They can be isolated from the corporate network. We still want to make sure that people aren't coming in with viruses and infecting that across the network. Yes, Sam? What other access control checks do you have? Service packs, uh, I, uh, you know, operating system versions, absolute structure, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, uh, Sam's question is what other uh, uh, checks do we have for the particular client? Uh, so today we have the antivirus check. It's checking the, uh, the manufacturer of the software and the version number and reporting those, and also checking to see if it's running. Uh, it currently doesn't check for, let's say, XP service pack 3 and above type of thing. OK, and then one other thing I'd just like to, to mention briefly is uh, kind of teleworker and branch uh, solutions. So if we look here at Meraki's list of networks, we have many, many networks. Uh, many of these are actually labeled as teleworker. And these are Meraki employees who've taken a, an AP home. And they're using that at home to connect back to the corporate network. And they're using that for, for two primary reasons. One is to connect wirelessly and access their local resources that are here in the headquarters. And the other is actually to plug in their VoIP phone. So many of them have phones at home. They can plug that in to the Ethernet port of an MR12 and actually use that to, to hook into our PBX system and use their phone that way. It's a really elegant solution in terms of enabling teleworkers, enabling remote sites or re remote areas where 
you might not have easy access and immediate access to the infrastructure, you can actually send someone out with an AP or mail it directly to them and have them connect back to the corporate network through a teleworker. Yes? From, from, a, from a box perspective, what's required to head in to support X number of teleworkers? Yep. So Sam's question is, from a box perspective, what's required on the head end? Uh, so there is a concentrator. It's a virtualized concentrator that actually uh, terminates the connections of these teleworkers. It's a standard uh, VMware concentrator. And that's no additional cost? Right, and that's no additional cost either. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have been told I have to ask my question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> IPv6 support. Yes, so uh, IPv6 is definitely something that's uh, out there and upcoming. Um, we, are, uh, we have some limited support today for IPv6. Uh, I'd say it's not uh, complete in all of our products. So but it's just basic dressing, no tunneling capabilities? Right, right, yep. How much IPv6 do you see now? Now? Hardly. Mm -hmm. And most of it is related to tunnel support. Okay. People building hurricane electric tunnels back to data centers to get it online. But I'm starting in my verticals education. And uh -huh. so they're starting to see a lot of that because they're finally getting allocations to push out to be ready to go. So if you look in your crystal ball, what would you say is like, you know, kind of adoption? When, when do you start seeing more and more activity at, to a significant level? First part of next year. First part of next year. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to take a while for it to ramp up this year, but people are finally starting to figure it out, especially with Atmic and uh, Aaron running low on addresses. Just yep. using that. <laughs> <laughs> Or something for me to throw. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll push out V6 when, when the code's ready. Everyone okay. has access to it. Right? That's kind of the way and that seems to be the popular answer today so far is that we will support it when we're ready. Yeah. Which, which is fine because there's a lot of things that have to be fixed first before we can support that. But you know, it's it's something that needs to be on the roadmap for everybody. Because yep. you don't want to be the one guy that doesn't support. Oh yeah, it absolutely. Any of you participate in IPv6 Day? World IPv6 Day. Yeah. World IPv6 Day. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I Can I ask a question about code that it just jogs up in my memory? I don't mean to sidetrack you, but Go ahead, please. we all get sidetracked constantly. <laughs> um, so I would imagine it's very, you guys are able to very quickly update features on the actual management side. Yep. Code on the actual you know, APs and, and the security devices and your switches and the various other products. Regular cycles, major releases, minor releases. Can you talk about how often you uh, roll out code updates? Yeah, so, so uh, repeating the question is, can we talk about how do we roll out code updates? Um, we talk a lot about how we add features into the dashboard, right? And so that's a great question. We, we do roll out major firmware updates to the APs. It's about once a quarter. And the way we do that is pretty seamless. Sanjit talked about it uh, in his presentation. And it's really designed to give the network administrator the flexibility of deploying that, pushing it out when it's desired, and, but also not getting in the way of a particular operation. So if you decide that, OK, I'm ready to, at spring break, I'm ready to push out this firmware, then you set your window, let's say Sunday at 2 AM. Or if you want to actually be on site during spring break and just watch it happen, let's say uh, Thursday at 1 PM, and then that's automatically pushed out to those APs. And we have some pretty sophisticated technology inside the APs that will actually download the new firmware, make sure it's actually a correct image of firmware. It can boot up, it can run, and only then try to swap from the old firmware into the new form firmware, test again, then make sure it's ready to go, and then use that as its main firmware. Do you have, uh, do you have the ability where one AP can become the master downloader, and then that's the only one that needs to download the code from the centralized system, and then it will push it out to the the other APs inside of your facility, so if you've got a large deployment of, say, you know, a couple hundred APs, we're not going out to the centralized system to download 100 images when you really need to download one. Yeah, Blake's question is, can you have a, a one AP kind of be the master and then serve the firmware image uh, to the others? So in, in general, no. Uh, the firmware images are, are fairly small, I'd say. Um, you can have an AP that's connected through, through a mesh link, for example, and it's going to communicate back to our cloud networking service that way. But it, it's not, you're not going to have a case where you have a, a master AP then that, that's delivering out for more images. When you say small, are you saying 5 megs, or are you saying 32 megs, or what are you saying for your? Uh, so it's, it's usually 3 to 4. Yeah. 
uh, uh, John's comment for, for the audience again, uh, usually three to four megs. Do they, do they keep running while they're downloading that, that image, or is it like an invasive process? Yeah, uh, Andrew's question is, do they keep running while they do that download? Uh, yeah, they do. And actually, you can see if you're monitoring the Ethernet traffic there, if you uh, actually are watching when the particular firmware is coming, you'll see a little, uh, little blip. It's downloading the firmware. It's still going, right? Then at some point, it's actually going to swap that out. You guys obviously have a lot of control. You know, you've added a lot that's you know, sort of above layer two here, the insight and functionality. Going back down to layer one, are you guys doing anything special under the hood or sort of you know, classic reference designs without much customization or custom design? Is there anything unique in the hardware? Yeah, so uh, Marcus's question is, is kind of going back down to the, to the physical layer and then kind of below that to the hardware layer. Uh, we do uh, design our, our products and uh, we don't manufacture them here, um, but we are looking at how to you know, get the best performance out of our hardware to support all of these things, right? Because as Sanjit mentioned, you know, we care about the whole stack. That definitely includes uh, the, the physical layer, and the hardware has to be there to support it. And doing things like um, application traffic shaping and looking at those packets, you, know, you need enough horsepower to be able to do that. And Sanjit has a comment in the back. Yeah, I think uh, if your question is about the RF, uh, so we actually yeah, do primarily RF. Yeah, like, so the RF front end, so the C-sensitivity, yeah. So uh, one other page I, I'd just like to wrap up on is this one called Summary Reports. Because it, it's a great way to, to see how a network administrator would actually get information delivered to uh, his or her inbox and actually be able to monitor on an ongoing basis at a higher level, at a summary view, summary level view, see what's going on. right? And for example, I can click by month to see any of the past uh, months that are here. Let's say, let's have a look at December 2011. right? We can see on this network there were uh, 339 distinct clients that connected. Uh, on average, on a given day, 138 clients connecting. And 682 gigabytes of traffic. Right? And you can see the usage pattern there. And we have this summary report showing us, OK, in this time frame, which were the top applications? Dropbox, we, we just saw that. Gmail, YouTube, Google Apps, and so on. Right? Pretty popular. Dropbox, 18% of the network. And then we can see also the, the top clients. Now, one of you is going to probably pop up for the month of January. Uh, we'll see which one of you actually ends up in that summary report. That's a look at the clients. And then from an infrastructure side, we can see similar types of information. We can see which particular access points were used the most for both traffic and actually serving distinct clients. For example, see this one, third floor support one, actually used the most traffic. But if I sort by number of clients, it's this one called fourth floor sales one, 191 clients. Right? So it's a great way to have a look at your infrastructure, have a look at your clients, see what applications are running on the network. And then here we see the, kind of the breakout of different operating systems. Yes, Andrew? Can you have any way of seeing which APs maybe have a top or channel utilization, see you know, where there's the most you know, spectrum usage and things like that? Yeah, uh, Andrew's question is, can you see which APs have the, the highest utilization? Uh, you can't see it on this summary view. If you click on the AP uh, itself, we can actually see that utilization. Let me, let me show you pretty quickly. Here, down here, and it scrolls back, let's say, for a week, and we can see that utilization. And actually, what we can see is that, oh, actually, there were some little blips in connectivity. For example, in this room, we were getting ready to set up. That AP in the back is plugged into an Ethernet port. We were testing the video, so we unplugged it for a little bit. Those kind of blips will show up in this this type of report. And you can see the utilization right over here. But it's, it's not part of the summary page that, that we were just looking at. And then this, grade is, th this page is great to look at. If we want to email it, we just email it to myself, sending. Or if I want to schedule monthly emails, send them to yourself, send them to your colleagues or your superiors, and so on. Great. Any questions? You guys? Yeah, everything in your, in your hardware is all 
what we would consider probably merchant silicon, you have nothing custom at all. Yep, for, for a silicon chipset level, yep. Well, the part I've designed again, the front ends are kind of, they're tweaked and customized and all that stuff, but we don't make ACES. Right. Yep. yep. Although, do we have time to show any of the other products or out? Yeah, I think, okay, got five, about five minutes left. Okay, so, Marcus, so yes. question about that. You know, it's, I find it interesting that, so, so these vendors come in as Wi-Fi vendors, you know, Aruba. You know, you guys obviously, Arrowhive and Ruckus have all created either switching products, routing products, you know, other networking products. What is it about Wi-Fi companies branching into those other areas? Is it just, you know, the edge? You just want to own the edge? Does it become that? Or, you know, what is it in the industry that drives Wi-Fi companies to expand? So, uh, you know, a lot of it, I think, has to do with what are the challenges that our customers are experiencing. Uh, wireless is certainly an access method that's uh, exploded in the, you know, the past several years, but that also naturally leads to one to think of, well, how does a customer handle Wi-Fi needs and how does the customer, in our case, a, a network administrator, they're serving their own clients, right? They have customers. What other needs do they have? What other pain points do they have? So that naturally, I think, leads to something like how to manage your network, how to manage your sites or groups of networks as they're distributed across you know, a whole country around the world. And that when we kind of look back and see, well, the access layer is just a part of actually the greater problem that this person is trying to solve. Yes, Sam. So from a, from a managed services perspective, you guys clearly have a, a fairly large infrastructure that you guys are dealing with. Uh, can you speak to any of your future looking plans as far as like Hotspot 2.0 technologies that are coming in? Are you plan to leverage your existing infrastructure to kind of help facilitate that or work with the telcos you know, for that type yep. of uh, Yeah, Sam's question is uh, how are we looking forward into the future? How are we uh, attacking things like um, Hotspot 2.0 and integrating with, with telcos? So uh, we are working with telcos, for example, Telmex that Sanjit mentioned above uh, in the beginning. And uh, a couple of things that they're looking at is offload using things like EPSIM. So we're, we are working with telcos like, like Telmex. Telmex actually has because they have so many uh, hotspots uh, in Latin America, they, they actually are pretty interested, pretty keen on getting this off the ground, getting it running, because they want to support both sides of their infrastructure, right? The cellular, the carrier side, as well as the, the Wi-Fi side. And because they have uh, a view and a piece of both of them, then they can actually work pretty effectively with vendors like us to actually integrate things or make things like EPSIM uh, more integrated into, into products. So it's definitely something that's uh, a part of you know the future of wireless, and you you probably have to say the future of cellular also, right? Okay, so I just want to take a quick moment to look at some of the other networks, and actually I'll be looking into uh, some of the networks that are powered by the products that are back there, and those are the Meraki Security Appliance, the MX, and if I simply click on that drop down for this network. I'm now looking at the wired network that's in this building as part of Meraki Corp. and is also part of the site-to-site -site network that we have over VPN with our remote sites, for example, in London. And here we see a summary level view, just like we saw for the wireless page. We see how many clients have connected, how much traffic they're pushing across. We see the usage pattern over here. And we can see, again, top applications that are on the network, top operating systems that are on the network, clients, there's no AP information here, right? Because this is a wired network. And we can, again, email this, look at the summary level data, get a high level understanding with some critical data of what's happening. Now, I, I mentioned the, the VPN, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But if we want to look at clients, the same view as we had on the wireless page, right? I can click on a particular month and look at all the clients that have connected in that month. I can search for any type of device, like an iMac and look at all the iMacs that have connected, how much data they're using, right, et cetera, et cetera. The same type of visibility into the network, same type of visibility into the traffic. We can see some UDP traffic, some window file sharing, the same interface for the wired network now, right? And here again, we can drill in to any particular app. Windows file sharing, so we have some file sharing servers, no surprise there. Some backup machines, some fax machines, and so on. And this one here, of course, the vast majority of the traffic. This is our main file sharing server. Question for you. 
Yes. Um, specific to roaming from one access point to another, um, if you're doing it to one access, do you do opportunities to key caching or PMK? I mean, what do you guys do, or do you do anything? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, layer two roaming right now, and we have layer three roaming on our roadmap. Uh, it's definitely uh, something that uh, a few customers are, have asked about, so it's something that we're implementing. Are you doing any of the key caching protocols for, for faster layer two roaming? Uh, our layer two roaming is pretty fast, I'd say. Um, I'm not sure ex uh, specifically which protocols we implement. I don't know if John can answer. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we do a normal like, uh, fast and off stuff to reduce the, the, the yeah. cycle time. We budget some of the more advanced stuff, but a lot of it has to do with integration compliance, so we've been trying to figure out exactly what our plans are going to be. But mainly we've been focused on uh, VoIP roaming specifically, and making sure that people can do well, um, because that's the biggest application. Yeah, so John's answer is that we've uh, mainly been focusing on VoIP roaming to make sure that works. Yeah. yeah, I guess one would assume that if you're doing a pre-share key, that would be simpler, right? But if you're doing it to an extra voice, right. there's that, that key session, right? Right. That you have to do a full roam, get it to an extra Right, right. Okay, the, the other thing I mentioned for the wired network is the VPN. And the VPN really lets us connect multiple sites together. And in this page, we can monitor and keep an eye on all those locations, see which ones are online, see what the connectivity is between them. For example, we have a branch in London here. It's labeled Branch London Firewall. Uh, you can see the subnets that are advertised to the VPN peers. And you can even see in real time if it's connected or not and what that latency is. So latency and last heartbeat are updated, as you can see there. And so this is keeping an eye on that link between those sites. Yes, Sam. Your VPN So, uh, so the, uh, Sam's question is, uh, are we doing OSPF, uh, and it's particular to, to VPN? So we actually have uh, our own technology that's enabling this VPN, and actually takes care of going through NATs and firewalls and things like that, and connects them together. It's not uh, OSPF. Uh, it's similar to OSPF, I'd say, but it's not uh, like a, a standard version of OSPF. Yeah, and I think the great thing is, uh, really, we, we can see this monitor page um, once it's up and running. You know, how did we get that to be up and running? Is by configuring those VPNs. Uh, of course, we're running Meraki uh, equipment between our sites. We could also integrate with uh, any standards-based IPsec VPN. But it's as simple as clicking Disable to Enable and selecting which subnets participate in that VPN network. Those are made available to the peers, and then that's all you have to do. So the cloud is taking care of that route discovery, the route updating, negotiating security uh, parameters. If there's a dynamic IP address at any of those firewalls, then updating the routing table to reflect that and making sure that all of those peers can talk to each other. Wait, I don't have to configure IP and IPsec policies? Correct. Yeah, that's actually one of the huge things to <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to wrap up. I'll just quickly go into our switches. Switches we announced just last week, uh, so brand new. But if you want to have a look at, at what that interface looks like, of course, it's in our dashboard. It's uh, pretty similar in the, the kind of views and visibility that you'll get into that network. 
This is an overview of our switches that are here in San Francisco. I can look at any one of a number of switches. I can look at all of them at the same time. Uh, we can also virtually stack them. So if you want to manage any number of ports on switches, you can do that through this interfa interface. Of course, they can be physically stacked as well. We have that 10 gig fiber connectivity between the MS42s that we mentioned. And if I want to actually get details on a particular switch, then I can see which ports are plugged in, which ones are not, what's the connectivity information, and even run a test, for example, on, say, ports 20 to 22. And this is actually going to run a cable test between ports 20 and 22 and see which ones, down to the individual twisted pairs, are healthy and which ones are not healthy, even me measure the cable length. Not disruptive. Uh, it is disruptive. It is momentarily disruptive, uh, as you saw there for just a couple seconds. And you know, even measure the cable length if you have a cable that's out of spec, that uh, might be a clue. Actually, it's, it's not disruptive for gigabit Thank you, Sanjay. It's not disruptive for gigabit dis devices. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, line rate, everything? No yep. subscription? Yep. And then you can see here some statistics for all of those ports on this switch. For example, what's the uh, link negotiation? Is there PoE uh, in use or not? How much data is flowing across those? Uh, probably not that much activity right now. Many of the, the people who are physically connected to this switch have probably gone home. But you'll see this uh, update in real time as traffic flows there. Port mirroring, do you, how, many, how many sessions per source do you have? Uh, so we don't have port, port mirroring implemented today, but it's something that, that we're looking at. Yeah. You said you just launched these switches. Last week, yes. Yeah. yeah, two weeks ago. So is your plan to maybe like provide an entire package to, let's say, a customer? Yeah, so George's question is, is there a plan to provide an entire package? So definitely, yes. From the, the uh, access layer, be it wired or wireless, all the way up to the, the firewall and security appliance. Uh, when you did your uh, customer display there, you had, you had some healthcare uh, customers up there. Do you find that you're replacing, let's say, enterprise wireless with yours, or is it more of like a guest solution? Um, you know, do you have any hospitals that are fully outfitted with your product? Yeah, so uh, George's question is like, uh, kind of what's your uh, foray into enterprise, uh, or is it just a guest Wi-Fi? So definitely we have uh, uh, hospitals and, and many other verticals that are completely deployed with, with Meraki. Uh, for hospitals specifically, uh, I can point out uh, Montefiore, and Montefiore is uh, probably in the top 1% of healthcare organizations uh, in the US uh, in terms of technology and IT leadership, and they've deployed Meraki for, for their wireless. Things in, in this maybe way on the field, but I, I have a, a fairly deep government background, so I've worked in facilities that internet connections did not go into. And I mean, your, your technology is the interface is pretty sweet. <coughs> would there ever be a time when she would consider having some sort of a management, you know, appliance to where networks that do not reach out touch the internet? Yeah, so the question is, you know, if, for example, for a government situation, or would there be any time that we would consider having a, a deployment where there's no traffic going out to the internet whatsoever? And uh, for, for all of our customers today, this is really what we present to them as, as a way to approach that. For certain customers, we definitely uh, look into that and see uh, how to deploy that at their site. Uh, I think that you know, the, one of the main benefits of this architecture is that we have a knock so that the customer doesn't have to have one, sure, right? Sure. And because we've spent years and years building this, but certainly for the, for the right uh, customer that we, we could investigate that.